what matters is the pace of which, with which we manage to ship things or get things done. And if something don't work out, we don't bitch about it. We move on and we try to focus on the next high impact initiative. And that's our ethos. It's all about focusing on the high impact initiatives. That was Peter, co-founder of Near Week, the OG newsletter of the Near ecosystem. I love this podcast because Peter is Danish and the Danes are very direct and honest in very unique ways. The result, an insightful, high value signal to noise ratio and some hilarious moments along the way. Some of the things that we discuss include coming to Web3 from the other end, namely Denmark as a country with high levels of trust in government, the role of diversity in determining people's ambition and hustle culture, Alpha, which is now public news around leadership changes, the good, the bad, the ugly, the AI president, and more. One final note, this podcast was recorded just before NearCon. So without further ado, I'll let you enjoy this wide ranging, wholesome conversation with Peter. Bye. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Wild User Interviews podcast with me, AVB. Today, we've got a clash of the media titans. It is an absolute honor to have with me, Sir Peter, founder at Nearweek. Welcome, Peter. Thank you very much, AVB. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Your contribution is much appreciated in this ecosystem, and I hope you know you've been appreciated since day one, sir. Thank you. Well, some people do, some people don't, but we do what we can. I usually start with a weird analogy, often fucking up people's names, but yours is pretty straightforward. So I want to say something that I may have to take out afterwards. Go ahead. For some reason, for the longest period of time, I thought you were like a like Peter from like Vietnam, Peter. I don't know why I thought that Near Week was being run in Vietnam by a Vietnamese guy called Peter. And I guess at some point I realized that I was confusing Near Week with some of the other Twitter handles that have Near in the name. So anyway, surprise. <laughs> I'm not Vietnamese. Maybe you can tell, but maybe you can. But actually, I, would, I don't blame you because we have a pretty big active Vietnamese community and many of the most like active news channels are in Vietnam. So would have made perfect sense. We definitely have an active community there. I don't know if I've been told this before, but just from looking at you and for the people listening, maybe go to YouTube for a handful of seconds, you may fall under the category of ethnically ambiguous. Like you could that's potentially actually, be from many places. That's a good, that's actually good. That's a good way of putting it. I'm actually, I'm a quarter Arabic and then yeah. 70 75%, I don't know, Danish, Caucasian, whatever we call it, like Northern European. I could be a bit anywhere, I guess. That was a Trump cart there with a 5%. Could be anywhere, you know? Yeah. No, that's interesting. Yeah, I can see that. That's awesome. So you were born in Denmark. You lived there all your life. Yeah, very much like, pretty much like a fairy tale life up until I joined crypto and then my world exploded. No, no, but it's, Denmark is a really nice place. Uh, super safe. We trust very much in our government. We trust our systems. We trust our healthcare. So actually, I'd say something you're not exposed to in Denmark is actually the the crypto world or the Web three world because there's so much trust, right? We don't really need it. And then again, maybe we actually do right to be able to monitor what people consider to be well working democracy because we don't really know. What go, what's goes on be behind the closed doors, like budget wise, how money is being spent, our state just keeps growing, like the bureaucracy keeps growing. So the government is by far the biggest employer in the country, not just considering people who have what we call like warm hands, like people who actually do the work, nurses, doctors, roadway workers, all that kind of stuff, but also people just like the bureaucracy is starting to become insane. And that's when I'm like, is that the way we should be spending money? Are we, we just really making things really complex? And just maybe the government is just growing into this massive, the biggest, I don't know, body that people should vote for because it's their employer, right? So I actually believe crypto is super important no matter where you are in the world. Interesting. I had a brunch with a friend today. She just got a job, congratulations. And she was like, this is bullshit. New job, she's 
getting a pay rise. Now she gets kicked onto the legs bracket. We've got progressive taxation in Australia, so depending on how much you earn. And she's like, there's almost no incentive to work more and take on more responsibility because now I'm on a higher bracket. So I'm basically getting paid a little bit more than before, but it's not proportional with how much extra work you put in. It's not like you get taxed 55%, but you only do 55% of the work. It's now motherfuckers. Like I'm still here at nights, weekends. If I'm getting overtime, if I'm getting more money because it's more responsibility, where's the money? So anyway, I welcome her to the Libertarian Party, but it's interesting because even countries like Australia that are advanced and safe, because it is largely a migrant country, even if 90% come from the UK, but do you think that people have something, like they've got a chip that they question a little bit? Clearly not the most active. There's been some shit going down here that you really raise my eyebrows. But I never thought about it in the context of Denmark. When you talk about people from Denmark, it seems like everyone's just happy to pay 55 yes. And the government gives you everything. There's cookies, there's school, there's healthcare, and everyone's just literally one big family. So it's interesting to hear your reflections on how it evolves because bureaucracy unchecked, it's obviously going to keep growing. And Exactly. And I think that, I think Denmark and Australia are very similar. I'd say the most Australian people I've met we're very like-minded. In Denmark, it's just starting to become, as you say, on progressive taxation at least. I'm happy to pay my tax. I love the fact that I can just go anywhere at any time. I'm not afraid of, it doesn't matter where you go, basically, more or less. We have crime, but we don't really have crime. But then again, at some point, you're like, where does all of this extra money go? We have the same sort of taxation on your nights. It kills the incentive to some degree, I would say, because... Why work more and make a little more, but not get the benefit you want, right? Yeah. The problem is there is a defined range. There is a range. Minimum wage here is high. You can have Same. any job and you'll survive. Decent life. Nothing fancy, but better than 99% of the world. The problem is that there's also an upper range. If you want to break out of that range, you have to get out of Australia. In the United States, there's no minimum. I've met many people, including people that move on to become very successful, that they lived in their cars, or that there's really no safety net for the most part, but there's no upper bound. No one will tell you you're making too much money in the US. If, if anything, it fuck yeah, double it. How much? Double it. Ah, that guy over there has triple that. You're a pussy. It's, a, it's an interesting cultural thing because... I don't know exactly where it comes from or how it evolves. Obviously, that unfettered growth and aggressive pursuit, maybe not sustainable, maybe not for everyone. To me, the tragic thing is to think of all the people that could have been the thousand X, the billionaires, the Elon Musks, and they're not because they're chilling in a village in Denmark or in regional Australia. But it's a mindset thing as well. If I'd say there are just, there's just, there's just one Elon Musk and there's a reason for that. I think it's very much about what you choose to pursue and what kind of possibilities you have. Like in Denmark, education is free. That basically means you can, depending on your grades, right, you can become anything, but people don't. But it actually introduces a weird variant to the equation. You know the PayPal mafia? Uh, the PayPal mafia? No. Oh my God. Okay, so back in the day... There is PayPal, which was started by... Oh, your yeah, PayPal. Sorry. Yeah, I know about yeah. PayPal. Sorry. And there's X.com, started by Elon Musk. Yeah. The banks were not happy with digital money, so they merged forces to be able to withstand regulatory scrutiny. Anyway, from that early cohort at PayPal, if you were to track all the people that were there, it's just incredible. There's David Sachs. And there's the LinkedIn guy and basically incredible companies, multi-billion dollar companies spawning everywhere. But if you dig a little bit deeper, there's actually something even more interesting than the PayPal Mafia, because PayPal Mafia is just the one company. But you can actually get a smaller cohort of really fucking impressive South Africans. And there seems to be a very special combination of growing up in a country with a lot of adversity. Like you're really street smart and you're really, I don't even know how to describe it, but you've got that hustle and then you go to a country where everyone's chilling, but it's yeah. a capped opportunity. Because yeah. what I'm wondering is maybe the Danish don't have that struggle 
to to give them that desire to to really be looking for opportunities and but it's true it's true but i think also that's what i really like about the the web3 space if i take my own journey into consideration i spent a fair amount of years struggling with a concussion i was about to finish my master's degree in like business economics and then i got a severe concussion didn't know how to handle it spent i don't know it's been eight years i still struggle with it now and then but that put me into a limbo i couldn't really work a normal job very fortunate to live in denmark at that time because they could support me but no one knew how to treat a concussion it's like a black box i could probably have gone to the most advanced clinics in the u.s but i had no idea should have called so, joe rogan yeah i should have called joe rogan he could have helped me out the thing is I, i just started doing a lot of different things because I question what is it I want to do in this world. I thought I was going to be a consultant like anyone else from the business school. And then I was like, yeah, exactly. Then I was like, no, I don't think that's my thing. So I started to work with smaller startups, a jewelry company, a, a festival, a restaurant, a clothing company. And then all along the really road, I, exactly. No, I was just like, I need to try different things. And... Then I Respect. came across uh, crypto 2017, thought it was interesting, but I was like, I'm lacking skills, always been interested in tech, but didn't really believe in myself. And then in 2020 or oh, 2019, when I came across Nia, I thought it was super interesting platform and I could just tell the team that built it was super serious and really skilled and tried to figure out how I could get my way in because I could definitely tell that this was a The Web3 scene was still very vibrant, like still is very vibrant and young. And that was a way for me to maybe get a job there. And we was just copying Week in Ethereum to begin with that concept. And then it was just a straight hustle from there and grinding. And because I spent all the hours and all the time I got to here, I would have never have imagined that this would have become a reality two years ago. But space really shows you like the land of opportunity if do if, you feel or do you think that you've made it and i guess it's a very it's a very subjective definition but i guess i see it as some sort of sense of security or progression no would I, be there's a lot of progression but i haven't made it i what i realized i guess after the bull market i was like i'm here i'm lucky to be I'm happy to be here. I'm learning every day. This is my trajectory. So I wake up every day with a goal of learning more. And if all of this goes away tomorrow, I'll be super sad, but I'll, I've also learned a ton of things. So I think a lot of people in this space, they're like, and also if you look at the narrative on Twitter, it's all about getting rich and, you know, buying the next coin and the token. And it's like, it drains you mentally, right? You burn out. The problem was... We were rich. It's not a narrative. It was a reality for a little bit. And it's all vanished. So some people dream of Valhalla. Will it come back? Will we magically be rich again? Some people, and I would like to think I'm on your same category. It's the same. It's already lost 90%. But every day you wake up and the question is, okay, what can I learn? What can I do? And... I try to think of it in a very pragmatic way. Like what would trigger the next bull run? Uh, suspending disbelief, obviously it's not a one person effort. If we can make that value or that belief expand, I've been trying for a long time and, and I'm glad that it's now taking off being the builder blockchain, being really aggressive around, hey, instead of selling a narrative or pipe dreams and people buying because they think that one day it will be, why don't we just try building something? Like it's, I reckon it can be done. It can, but it's building something is not easy either, right? Which is why we have such an interesting job as media. I see it as putting out the bad signal. Perhaps yours is different because you actually sent a newsletter. But if we think about media broadly, and this is only the other thing about the podcast, and I just hired two amazing people, Heiko and Cindy, uh, that are going to help me create more shorts. Our job isn't really to entertain the same couple hundred people every week. Our job is... How can this message reach the next person that will come in and build something new, better than what we could have imagined? We don't know how to fucking sell it. 
I can show the technologies, but the idea will come from someone else and the execution will come from someone else. And uh, yeah, I, th I think that's a challenge. Building is hard, but we just have to attract the people that can make it happen. Exactly. I think it's a lot about awareness in general. And I think it's also starting to crystallize. We see how some of the biggest steps in the world are powered by Nier. It feels like the rest of the crypto world don't really, they don't really jump into this narrative. They don't really feel it's cool because what's a native user, would... what's not a native user. But to me, this is, this is the way the blockchain should be used. Like you figure out where it fits into your tech stack and you I... take the best of it. The meme, the G, that it's no. like a guy with all the mixed up timelines and he's like explaining them and it's all crossed up. That's pretty much what my notes look like and how we get in and out of super random topics. I would be patient and understanding of other ecosystems that don't get near yet. Because to be perfectly honest, we don't get it. Just in the last few weeks, there's been a few narratives entering the arena that I feel like I'm struggling to understand, not the narrative, but the meaning of the narrative. The transactions, account abstraction, that shit's last year. Chain abstraction and like AI governance. There's just so much packed in there. There's some alpha that I got pinged at 4 a.m. in the morning today, local time. And it will be public by the time I release this podcast so we can just talk about it. You know about it, yeah? Maybe someone must have pinged you European time. Something about a dragon hovering over the, the slopes of Switzerland, warming up uh, people's hearts and assholes with his fire. Sure. Honestly, I don't know how I feel about it. How do you feel about it? I'm not sure what kind of alpha you're talking about. Maybe you can go into a little bit more detail. Yeah. I haven't checked my, I haven't checked my email this morning. Oh, my telegram. Ilya is soon to become the new Near Foundation CEO. Oh. I didn't know. Maybe I had a feeling, but who's going to run? I just realized the alpha will it's be public one. by the time the podcast goes out. But what? technically, I should not have told you. So keep no. it on the wraps. I didn't see it coming at all. I Me mean, neither, actually, to be honest. I didn't see it coming at all either. At all, actually. I like it because what I like about it is I think that from a business development perspective, it's extremely strong to have a... a kind of like a founder-led narrative. If you look at many of the other big blockchain foundations, the way they do their business development is basically that it's run by the founder, right? And I just think it gives some sort of credibility. Do you have some examples? It's, I think it's Ava, Ava Labs, right? Polygon 2. The Ava, um, La Ava Labs has that dude uh, is super fucking annoying. Yeah. N Nair or something, whatever his name is. Look, I agree, but I'll, I'll tell you first my hesitation and then i'll tell you what i'm excited about hesitation the eastern block to some extent some people may argue follow Ilya, so he controls the ndc he is also ceo of pagoda he is now on the board of the near foundation so he is meant to oversee the ceo of the near foundation that institution and he's now taking over ceo of the near foundation some may say this is tricky from a legal standpoint. In fact, I've been told that this was meant to happen a long time ago, but it's just been an ongoing conversation just to make sure everything is done right. But even if we assume that the legals are done right and the foundation has always been good at that, it then becomes the public perception. And it can go either way. It can be like, this is a centralized piece of shit. Or it could be finally the founder that may have been out of the picture for who knows what reason. Finally, he's coming back. And finally, he's dropping the narratives and finally he can put things in place. Some other thoughts, I hope that he adds to the picture. I would be very disappointed if they stopped doing some of the big business development deals. But what I think I'm the most excited about is the AI governance and exactly. the AI CEO. Dude, he's been dropping these hints for months now. And I thought it was going to come for the NDC, probably very soon. We'll start seeing some experiments there. But if it starts doing that shit within the foundation, I don't know. I think that we could potentially have not just a blockchain that looks very different from a technical standpoint, but even the way that it is operationalized and ideally even the cost. I don't know. I think you're very right about that. I had an interesting call the other day with a guy who ran like an incubator lab. And 
was very successful doing it at different companies. And he was really into AI and basically set up this founder's assistant. He needed, he needs, as he said, I thought I could just run a company using A and AI, but I realized like I need people. So he's just trying to replicate everything they've done, like there's their myth, methodology, how they build companies, put it into an AI assistant. And then obviously you need someone to prompt it, right? That's why he was interested in blockchain because on the governing side of things, all of a sudden you have an entity that can disperse funds, pay bills, all of that stuff, right? But you obviously want to set up some sort of guide, governance and, and, and guidelines to it. But I think it's super, it's a super interesting, I think the next five, 10 years, I wise, it's going to be insane okay. to be honest. But again, okay. I've been having this conversation with a few people, including my muggle friend that I had brunch with. She knows nothing. We're just talking about tax, right? But what I've been trying to explain to people is normally where there is hesitation around an AI and governance is because we assume that someone's just going to sit there talking to ChatGPT. And by the way, ChatGPT is great. I use ChatGPT a lot and is largely being shaped. Like, and we've been done, <laughs> let's just write a commission, has been able to do a week's worth of work in two weeks because of ChatGPT, because it's like having a team of four or five very smart people. But Ilya takes it one step further. He's not talking to ChatGPT. He wrote the code that enabled ChatGPT to exist. Hmm. The article where he explains why he left Google to found Near.ai and the concept of Near.ai is still available in his medium, published in 2016. Share it. You should share it with the audience. It was predictive coding. I was reading the article in 2020 and I was like, this guy's fucking out of his mind. There's absolutely no way that you can have an AI that can just write code for you. Lo and behold, it is released to the public a couple of years later. So where I think that we're going is he must have a way to talk to machines that we just don't understand yet. And he is probably going to build something into this governance around KPIs, governance, getting data directly from the blockchain, sampling large groups of people. I don't know. If I knew, I probably would be the host of a podcast and I'd probably be making yeah. money somewhere else. But I think that's what gets me excited. It's almost like a religion at this point. I just believe that there is a master plan. No one can confirm or deny. But this motherfucker is clearly scheming something. Agreed. I think it's also just about time where technology is ready. For it. And I feel that's been actually Nier's play all along. And that's why I've been extremely bullish about Nier all this time is that it's really a long-term play. And we got to have confidence in, in the tech that rolls out. Maybe someone else is going to come along the way. But I really feel that the foundation or a superior tech stack and platform is in place. And we have some people here that are on top of their game. So I'm just super excited to see what happens. I like the framing that Kendall had, which is a traditional startup fr a frame. You'll show you need a miracle for it to work. If it's a marketplace, you need two miracles. And depending on the business that you're going into, you need many miracles for it to be successful. And if you replace the miracles with what are all the intersecting narratives or problems or the interests of the founder, that is where Neo really stands out. If you create a blockchain because it's fast and you can do what Ethereum can better, like a Solana, great. And you can and will do what Ethereum can better. But you're still looking at a narrower set of use cases to some extent. Dude, Ilya has been spilling some fire in terms of people having personal servers and the importance of owning your data. But like he means it. Like we're building the entire infra of the internet. And I think that now that people are waking up to how valuable the data is, because we can see the, all these open source models, we may finally see a shift in those consumer patterns. The reality is we've been saying that data is in your oil for a long time, but no one cares because whatever, we, we, it wasn't tangible. But yeah, I, th I think that you've got the intersection of he cares deeply about the problem. He's got that vision of how it could be different. He was from within Google. I think he's seen some evils that we really can't start to fathom, by the way. Alex from Human Guild, he told me that early days, investors told them to cut the anti-big tech, like they were going too hard at it. So I think that when you put all those things together, we do have a fundamentally different tech stack. 
not only has it been thought very differently from the ground go, from the get go, from the ground up, but also you've got that vision and that drive to make it happen. And it's going to sound really weird, but often the scaling problem for the blockchain is a human component. Humans don't scale. And you mentioned something before. We need to find a way, if we can find a way to scale through software, the human component, in the same way that we scale the actual blockchain through software, just can you imagine if the fucking marketing DAO was an AI that you just give it the parameters and it goes and assess and watches everything that you do and either gives you money or doesn't give you money. And we save $20,000 a month giving money to some poor assholes, whatever. I don't know. I'd like to dream. But do you think that's, is that a scary dream or it's, is it a wonderful world to be in? Do you know what I mean? I'm definitely of the conviction that AI will help us out, but I also think it's super scary, right? What does it actually mean? Do you know, it's a lot about, I think I could, I think I would, to make an analogy, the first time I tried to park a car with a parking assistant, I was, I, so I borrowed my, my brother-in-law's fancy big Volvo four wheel something massive car and he was away for the weekend. Danish car ever. Yeah. He was away for the weekend I was, and I was taking care of his house. And then I was just about to park outside my workplace. I find this sweet parking spot between two cars. I put on the parking assistant and it tells me what to do. I drive a little bit forward and then it tells me like, hands up the wheel. That was a super, super scary moment. I took my hands off the wheel I started going back and all of a sudden it just started speeding up and I barely managed to press the brake full on. And then obviously I hit the car behind me just a tiny bit. And then I was just like, whoa, I'm never trusting technology again. Do you know what I mean? It felt super scary. It was just a bad experience. But then, then you've obviously seen, you've seen Elon Musk driving around California with his car for an hour without even touching the wheel. I feel that like technology is really starting to catch up. When I was a kid, this is super random, but I used to think of my grandma's childhood and I was like, she didn't have electricity. Like she was alive when radio was invented. If you see how much we've progressed in just a hundred years, even in the last 20 years, I've come to terms with the fact that in 10 years, in 20 years, the world is going to be unrecognizable. If God forbid we're to have another concussion and you wake up in 10 years time, you would probably not be able to recognize or understand how the world is working. Is it scary? Yes. Is it scary because is it going to be negative? Or is it scary because it is natural to fear the unknown? I'm not sure. And this is perhaps where we can make the argument. There is a possibility that it is going to be negative. It just depends who controls the fucking algorithm. If it's Google, dude, I am ready to party and spend all my money and I'll be out by my own terms and my own means in the next five years. That's not just not a world that I want to be living. That's just dark. At Facebook, I'd be a little bit more comfortable, but probably still not. But if you can have your power of data, money, and governance, motto of New York, we may have a chance. I don't know if this is technically accurate, but I was trying to explain to a friend, uh, Oli, uh, Misfits Oli, he's up in Sydney. We, we talk all the time over the phone. He's like, oh, we should have a, a large language model on the blockchain. I was like, what exactly is the problem that you're trying to solve? Because the stack, as I visualize it, is we've got the model, like the actual code, the algorithms. OpenAI is a closed source, but there's a bunch of open source ones, Hugface and, and Facebook, and the open source ones are getting pretty good. Then you have the computing. Say you take someone's code, where is it running? And there you could run it on your private computer, on your servers, which is why all these regulations and all this AI. They're like, oh, what are you going to do? Make it illegal for someone to run code on their personal computer at home? What are you going to do? Go in and take away the computer? Or you could run it on the cloud or on a Google or something. But the next stage, which is the most interesting one, is the data that you feed into the model so that regardless of where the code is executing, you get an outcome. And at the moment, as I understand it, most of these models are like pre-populated with just a shit ton of historical data. But assuming that the models will be open sourced and anyone can take them and that you can just choose where to run it 
assuming you have enough computing power, etc. Let's assume that those two are not an issue. The real question is, who is going to control all the giga shit ton of data that we're going to need to have really good models in five years' time? Because the really good models in five years' time are going to need the information from right now till five years' time. Where is all this information being captured? Dude, there is so much. People must be starting to realize. Every single Tesla has been gathering data, driving down the road for years. Who is to say that a group of random Germans don't say, fuck it, we're all going to have a webcam on our cars and we're going to have our own gigabillions de- miles of data. I think there's a project on Solana like that, Helium or something. So I, I think that's going to be the question. And then I guess like, the last mile is, assuming that all the data is on a blockchain where you can control who gets access to, it shouldn't be tribal. Like you can still choose to get the data to Google, but maybe you have more control over how it's used or may, you may get, may get attribution if it's used for say derivatives work. I don't know. I'd love to have Ilya so that I can just spend two hours looking at the screen and he can explain all this stuff to me and I can listen to it several times, but that's how I perceive it now. I think you're going to get your two hours time at Neocon, no? We're cooking. I got to talk to the chefs. I'm not sure what's, what's in the menu yet, but we're cooking for sure. It's good. Yeah, but I, I agree with you, I think. But I think also if we look at it, like the Transformer paper Ilya wrote, how many years is that? Is that 17? They wrote in 19? I don't know. It took many years for the commercial product around it. I feel the same about me. It's, it's, that's a big vision here and, and it's just going to take longer to achieve it. But we're slowly getting there and winning day by day. And I think that's the most important thing. There's been a lot of chat talks about our community. We're not getting builders enough, all that stuff. And people are constantly comparing their communities to learn all the others. Like Ethereum, it's been around for plus 10 years. That's what it takes to build a great community. Do you know what I mean? And people got really rich on the way up. People stick around. Same goes for Solana. It hasn't been around for as long. But a lot of people made a lot of money, made people hang around. I can't speak about Solana because I'm sure that the pace of innovation is faster. But at this Ethereum, it's easier to explain to people because it's hardly ever an upgrade. There's hardly ever new tooling available. Like we're pretty much playing with the same Legos. Oh, sure. There's a protocol upgrade. Now it burns fees. Now it's proof of stake. It doesn't really change much. You can't really build anything differently for, from a consumer point of view. So yeah, the problem that we have with Neary is these motherfuckers are dropping particle upgrades every three weeks, introducing more and more complex layers to the stack that, yeah, it can be hard to keep track of. Just before we move on from the AI side, as a written world, for the most part, newsletter, do you have any concerns about the future of AI and how that may impact your week? No, I would say... Got to move along with it, got to, got to embrace the technology, got to keep using it, start using it, understanding it, and develop along, alongside the tech instead of fearing it, it's going to eradicate it. And I also see Neowig as very much like a, a project in motion, started out as a, as a newsletter. Now we're building components and widgets on the bus, and we're running our processes through like on the newsletter side of things, that's run through a DAO. So just using a very basic community, like tooling for community sourcing and rewarding Jupiter's for helping out making the newsletter. But what if that became its own product? And what if we could learn the big media, something about running the, some parts of the tech stack on blockchain or doing things differently? So I'm, I'm starting to much more see it as a project where we actually have the opportunity to experiment a lot more and actually move into a direction of much more software-based company. Same goes for Heroes. We're building a bounty platform, trying to empower the near ecosystem and the different communities and in general, just trying to help onboard more people to get paid working with projects and solving tasks on near, right? so that we can grow the ecosystem because we've been missing this kind of infrastructure tooling. Yes, we had the AstroDAO, all about the bounty process from an NDC perspective. DevHub is running a ton it's of bounties. Horrible. Exactly. So we're trying to make, make that marketplace. So we're much more in, we're much more looking at how we can e- evolve into a software company and then still be a very community rooted project because that's what we care about the most. And then empowering people in the community 
such as yourself, such as Johan, such as El Cafecatel, such as Shadok, like the list goes on. And you still need people to do that. We still need human interaction. We still need good conversations. We still need to attract talent. We still need to give talent in the ecosystem a platform where they can grow. Oh, you got <laughs> what else it was it doing? Trying to track you outside the camera. Um, so I have some technical issues here. <laughs> no worries. So I think I see New Week much more as we're trying to make a shift into becoming much more like so. software based company and not just being a power user of software or of native uh, blockchain solutions. Yeah. Is it working now? Oh, yes, oh, I got it. Because it, it's, it's automatically tracking your movement. It, yeah, it, it tries to. And I yeah. have to disable it every time because it's so fucking annoying. Why does it do that? Oh, uh, oh really follow. I wonder which part of you, which part of you is tracking. Probably a ghost here. No worries. Oh, dude, I have the, the funniest experience. I was walking down the street and there were some kids, when I say kids generously, they were like 12, 14, but they were like bigger than me. Shriek or trading. So this old lady goes out, they give, she gives them candies and chocolates. And I'm literally just walking down the street wearing my Aurora hoodie. And she offered me some. What? So she thought you were in like dressed up? I don't know. I don't know if she thought well, I was trick or treating. And I was like, yes, lady, I am dressed up as a hobo two years into a bear market. That's why I got here. And I was like, oh, maybe if I bags into my eyes, maybe yeah. look like a zombie. Like, what's a. Oh, but Aurora price pumped pretty hard. Yeah, for a little Isn't bit. It? I bought the top two. Anyway, I don't want to get started on that one. I, I, I like your approach. Neurig has something that LLMs will struggle with, at least for now, for a long time. Brand. You guys are good at branding. Heroes is yeah. a great brand too. I like it. Thank you very much. Yeah, we put a lot of effort into uh, branding or in general just design. Maybe it's because I've always been very interested in fashion. I have a particular things I like. And when you look at fashion, the projects that really make it, it, it costs the same to produce a t-shirt, but... How come someone can charge a thousand dollars if we really go out there for a t-shirt and someone can charge, I don't know, 20 bucks or 30 bucks, mostly it's because of brand, because there's a limit to how good of a t-shirt you can make, but there's no limit to how much of a brand you have and what it is people are buying into. And then, so that's one thing we really focus on, on design and branding and, and been very focused on that. If you had to like double click on that definition of a brand. What is it that enables you to charge a premium or, or, or something or that makes people want to seek something over something else? I think it's people's, obviously it's people's perception, but it's also how genuine you are. Like we, we really care about this, like the ecosystem. So we really feel like a part of the community and we really do what we can to actually empower the community. And we're, I would say we're fairly reachable. Like we have one guy, Frederick, all he does is social media. So he's constantly tweeting, commenting on all of the projects in the near ecosystem so that everyone in this ecosystem feels seen because the official protocol profile cannot do that. They have, they have a feed to think about. So we're trying to actually show people that we really care about them and that we encourage them to do more and try to give them a platform. And that's not just, maybe that turned into a brand, but that is actually who we really are. So I think branding is also very much about what it is about being genuine. Yes, you can sell dreams, you can do all of that, but at the end of the day, it will all feel fake if you're not really who you claim to be. Someone will find out at the end of the day. And I think we've been lucky to also, along the way, figure out to work with some of the most uh, contributing people in the ecosystem and people that are really devoted. So uh, we've been working with Kudam, he was doing near mates. And they were a lot bigger than Neweek at some point. I wanted to work with Neomates since day one. I suggested it. They were locked in to begin with. And then Kudam was like, hey, I want to join your team. Kudam was the first guy to join the Neweek team. He's an OG near ecosystem contributor, if you ask me. That's the part of the, our DNA. Same goes with, we had Ariana Latibochka, uh, near community uh, contributor. Hero, our latest edition, great contributor in this ecosystem. And Gus. My co-founder been in the space for super long, like it's in our DNA. And I think that's what gives the brand value at the end of the day, because if you were just assholes and we had a good brand, people would see through it. I think why it matters is because we actually care about it. 
No, that's interesting because it's really a spectrum. Let's say on the right would be like a corporate account, maybe more at stake, more managed, more curated. And then on the opposite end would be maybe like an individual. Let's say my personal account. I treat whatever, whenever. And that's why when the marketing dies, it's like, oh, give us a schedule of when you're going to post. I post when I have something to say. And that's why my posts do well. Because I don't post GM every day and people think I have nothing to say. I post when I have something to say. Sometimes I go for weeks. Sometimes I post seven times a day. Somewhere in the middle, I think would be the WePood account. Because it's kind of corporate in the sense that it represents a project. But it's also very playful. It doesn't really have anything to lose. And I think that it's been growing because of that authenticity. People know what they're getting into. It's not for everyone, but they know what they're getting into. I would say that Nearwick is probably in between WePod and the Near Foundation in the sense that it's also, it's also authentic, but it acknowledges that it represents the ecosystem. So I guess it's a bit more responsible or a bit more, there seems to be an awareness there of don't go crazy. There's 50,000 people following. Yeah. And just, we, I think also what is really important for us is also to encourage people and keep, yes, we need storming. But we don't need storming all the time. Like we need to move on and we need to work together to make things happen. So we're also just trying to keep a positive tone and get shit done. What matters is the, with the pace of which, with which we manage to ship things or get things done. And if something don't work out, we don't bitch about it. We move on and we try to focus on the next high impact initiative. And that's like our ethos. It's all about focusing on the high impact initiatives. And if things don't work out, that's fine. We move on. We stay friends with people. Like the rest of it is just, it's such a waste of time. If you look at how, if, if, I don't know, it depends also what kind of person you are. Personally, I get very, I throw myself into something like a project. And if everything around the ecosystem will affect me, which is also a pretty vulnerable situation to be in because if something's not working out in one place and it's basically outside of, my hands, I can't do anything to affect it. I still spend a lot of energy thinking about it, but I can't really do anything about it. So I'd rather leave that part out and focus on what I can do and where I can contribute and try to push the ecosystem in a positive way or do things that actually have that outcome. So we really aspire to be collaborative and keep a positive voice. Obviously we can all agree. We should, we need to disagree. Otherwise there's not going to be any good solutions, right? I think you've hinted at something, several things that are very important. The first one, obviously, would be just your personality type. Some people are more, how would you call them, agreeable and the opposite of agreeable. But I think that I'd be curious to learn how that process looks like inside the company. To define what's inside the control, what's not, how did something work, not how to assess possibility. So what I'm thinking is, if I were to defend people, and since I joined as far as the commission, I'm trying to be a bit more neutral, uh, which is great for mental health. I'm basically not <laughs> exactly. read a lot of messages from the NDC. Oh. But I can understand some people, say, sharing things on Twitter or raising their voice in some places as a combination of two things. And then we can, uh, you can self-reflect for near wikis on this. The first one would be, how stable is your position in the ecosystem? So when you think of your contributing month to month, can you still feed your family? And do you see that sense of progression? Do you feel appreciated? For a lot of people, that's been largely tied to community funding or second point, which is related is, are other people's actions so detrimental to the ecosystem that they actually do start to encroach in your area of operation or influence? I'll give you an example. Is there something so bad, say that it could potentially kill the near ecosystem or, or hold it back meaningfully? So bad that as near week team, you guys say, look, we would normally not give a fuck. We really don't want to be part of this drama. But if we don't take a stance or potentially help someone else, this may just be the end of the company because as the name implies, 100% of it is with this ecosystem and anything that is ecosystem threatening may push you over the edge. 
that may not be the case for near week or at least it will look different for different projects. I feel like different people have felt that like much sooner. Does that probably make sense? Yeah, I think it makes sense. I think it's very much a case by case and then a discussion. So we, in, inside our team, we're really good at having open discussions that don't get it to the, that we just keep for ourselves to get an idea of where things are moving. And sometimes getting a relief, what's going on, sometimes understanding what's going on because people spend their time differently. Sometimes people spend more in the system in different chats, people spend less. But in terms of if you actually felt something was really threatening the existence of the ecosystem, we would definitely do something about it. Then the question is, how do you do something about it and what do you do about it? And there are many ways to address issues. So I feel like it's not necessarily always, it doesn't necessarily always solve things to be, just to be vocal about things. It's super easy to, to put your opinion out there. I think what I've learned at least is what really makes a difference is doing something and showing that you've done something. And that way people, you earn people's respect and you can actually show you've contributed and then people value your voice. So that way, I think doing something and showing it's much easier than just talking. I wouldn't say talking shit, but just raising your voice. And I know it, it, it can be super frustrating being on the forum, raising your voice about stuff. But I also feel like this, I had to, I basically had to log up the near.org forum for a long time because I didn't feel like the debate was going anywhere. And as an ecosystem, I guess we're also struggling to figure out where we were heading. So it's probably a combination of both, but still it wasn't like a dialogue. It was more like, a monologue from each party doesn't really work. Yeah, I agree. I love having like really detailed frameworks. I think something about law, like it's very nuanced. You probably identified two categories. It would be like community talking shit. Like for instance, I could name a few. Community members are very active, but they don't really play a role, to put it that way. They go out there, you, you say something, or you go on the forum and you're literally just... It's almost two people fighting and you just join for fun and you're throwing punches. But I do think that there is a tier up of contributors. But as I mentioned before, at some point you're entangled and your work and your output gets compromised because of someone else's actions. And from my side, creative style was a, was an interesting challenge and a threat that we had for a long time because the marketing down the creative style were equal and when one was raising eyebrows both get put on hold and go into revision and there was always a tension there a real tension to differentiate ourselves and but anyway that's a really good take i think i'm wondering how much does that relate to some of the cultural aspects of just life in denmark maybe less words more action uh, I think we're very much doers, actually. That's just that the impression I get that we're very much focused on getting shit done and working things out. Sometimes it can be too consensus driven. Sometimes someone needs to take the stick and just run with it. People are going to follow your example, but I definitely believe that it's a core value and a thing in Denmark that we have to we have a situation. We got to deal with it. How do we move on from here? get everyone, get more or less everyone's input, then make a decision and then move on because we cannot keep on discussing the same thing forever. And I also think that to your point about the creative style and the marketing DAO, in general, people also need to remember that what we are doing is it has never been done before. A lot of the people that are part of the ecosystem have not built major communities before. They've been part of communities before. There's a big difference in actually building them. And it takes a lot of trial and error. And I think we often tend to forget in the near ecosystem what is actually at the core values of Ilya and Skidanov. Trial and error is a key process in everything we do. And if something doesn't work out, we move on. And people tend to forget that I'm of the belief that people don't act fully out of malicious, with malicious intention. I believe that people, if we take the creative down the marketing now, people are trying to achieve things and do really well, that's also going to shine a light on them and they're going to look great if they funded good things, did well, because they made some decisions that, that other people thought were suboptimal or things that didn't work out. 
that's what people focus on. We should much, much, I think we should much more focus on, okay, say this didn't work out. Well, let's not do that again and move on from here. That is something that I've built into all the processes for the Transparency Commission, which is pretty standard in the law. You need to look at the intent of the action. It's not the same if I'm on my phone and I run over someone because I'm not paying attention. And if I'm driving, I see someone and I say, oh, that motherfucker. And I literally get out of my way to hit them with my car. Like it's technically the same outcome, but very different um, intention. There were some shortcomings in analysis there with things like the election and the Election Integrity Commission. But I think that it's actually very helpful to try to understand where everyone is coming from because what I see is some people become very aggressive and a lot of the actions that they take, not malicious, but they're all been formed by the same initial circumstances, which is A, they've never had access or potential access to so many resources, perhaps so easy, and B, this may be their only chance. So you see some people that they're not malicious, but they may just be doing something that it's not aligned with near, and it may be grossly overpriced. And dude, I travel around the world, I can tell you what some people extracted from the community treasury for doing average to low quality work is enough to buy a property in these countries. So were they malicious? I personally don't care. Should we be funding people's uh, home in their country? Yes, if they contribute to a, to a standard equal to what they're extracting. And by the way, that's a value that I wrote into the marketing data charter. Always create more value than you extract. Simple principle. But anyway, I like it. I, I like the, the Danish pragmatism. In the most ironic of ways, I feel like maybe sometimes you guys should chime in to center us back into the pragmatic and then just get the fuck out. And that's the, that's the typical thing also about being the, the media, right? staying at the middle, but still trying to steer us one way, which is forward. And back to your point, also, maybe B, is I think there are many ways to deliver a message. And if people done something bad, and if you would say it's directly malicious, obviously we cannot have that kind of behavior. We need to set an example. If we can conclude that there was experimentation, which is at least encourage that they experimented, but obviously tell them how they did it, probably wasn't the best way to do things. It's and if they sentence. do it again, if they do that again, you can't do the same mistake twice. No. I haven't been up to speed with latest, um, as I said, credibly new, but I've been sent some screenshots and some updates. This seems to have been an irregularity with a lot of the ETH Milan uh, grants and the creative style approved. I think out of 15 teams, like less than half actually showed up, had the expenses paid. Long story short, the gangsters at the House of Merit passed a poll to pay the remuneration of the creative style out of the funds that should be returned from the people that didn't attend the event. Which basically means that if the money never gets returned, there's no compensation for the council. Anyway, I thought it was pretty savage, but it's an interesting incentive. And if we remove any names and any players, because it gets pretty feisty. Dude, that's how it used to work when I was working at a bar or at a restaurant when I was at university. At the end of the night, when you close the till, if it doesn't match, the money comes out of your tips. And if it doesn't match by more than a hundred bucks, that's a serious conversation. Maybe the end of your job. It may be like police involved if you're stealing money. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is it's a cultural value. Do you take ownership over your role and your responsibility? And I actually liked it. I have to confess, when I arrived in Australia from Venezuela, even though Venezuela is a crumbling country, middle class, middle upper class, at least in, in a former era, getting a casual job in Australia was a, yeah, it was a rite of passage. And it was weird at first, but then I feel like I learned a lot and I grew a lot. Just like serving people, everything about humility, taking pride in what you do. I think everyone should do it. And they everyone should, in Australia I, does it, by the way. Everyone here works age 16 onwards. Exactly. But that's the thing, same in Denmark, but the difficult thing is finding the right people. I think it's very much comes down to a people thing in general. How do we... But we should ask those questions. Think, you know, yeah, because we should, if you are from a country where whatever your family has dubious amounts of money and others being less and you think that some jobs are below you 
that's a red flag for me. And I go back to Venezuela now and I go to some countries now and I see these cultures and I don't like it. I feel uncomfortable. We may be feeding it by paying San Francisco salaries. And I don't know, especially really young people, people that may not have had that developmental curve of I went to uni, I had two casual jobs, I had a shit ton of debt. You respect the hierarchy because then you try to get a job when you graduate. Maybe there's a lot of stages through life that do. If you're 18 or even younger, selling NFTs and being a community moderator in a low cost country, getting paid bonkers amounts of money. To some extent, the question is, can we really blame them? We almost corrupted them, really. And I think that's why it comes back to us to think, okay, what are the incentives we're putting in place? What are the career progression plans we're putting in place? Exactly. I think it's much more about facilitating a clear career path because I must admit, if you be, yeah, we might, we look really young, right? We're super young at mine, but we're not the Incredibly young. Yeah. We're not the youngest. Dramatically young. We're going to, we can learn something from the uh, early 20 something people. They can learn something from us. We meet in the middle, but we need to facilitate that career path and people need to be able to see that there's a clear path that I can walk to achieve X, Y, Z. And that's something I think we need to do more of in the ecosystem is actually like on, we look at talent acquisition and in general, how we help talent grow and how we support them. It's not enough just to give them, like you grind your way to, you obviously achieve some sort of trust, but we need to do more check-ins. We need to do more knowledge share. We need to do more face-to-face. Also, it's all incredibly difficult to like achieve what we're doing, right? Everyone is sitting in front of their computer in very different parts of the world. We rarely have this one on one to one, right? Yes, obviously a lot of us meet at Neocon. Not everyone gets to go. Yes, a lot of us meet at various events around the world, but it's not like having that human connection is also an incredibly valuable link, if you ask me. And I think actually it's been scientifically shown that if you have a conversation with someone in real life for more than five minutes, you have a connection forever. There's your mind's just click, right? Which five is minutes. interesting. I think it's five minutes, which is interesting, right? We don't get that. We work this way. So I think also, we also need to look at what we're trying to achieve. Yes, it may seem straightforward, but it's actually really difficult. And we're learning all along the way. How can we take those learnings and adopt and admit that we were wrong without people hammering us in the head and then improving along the way? I think talent acquisition, especially in commu- like showing the community there's a clear path to become a member of the House of Merit or there's a clear path to become as a politics game. Can Ukrainian citizenship? Are you going to leave okay. that part in? Are you going to cut it out? Yeah, probably. Yeah, I'll see how I feel when I edit. Okay. Have you read a book and then watched a movie and you think the movie is not as good? Oh, yeah. Or sometimes times. even very bad. Yeah, many times. You know why? There is something beautiful about books, that there's only so much written and then your brain automatically fills out the rest. And quite often, even though the book describes it to you, for some reason, characters look different and the settings, you imagine them differently. And when you read it, it just had different impact on you. The movie just didn't capture that bit. I feel like it's the same when we don't know people. We only see that they're near wig and this is the work that they do. And there's a fucking guy with a Peter and a three in the name, which sounds like a shit password. Yeah. And people just start making shit up in their heads. Dude, I feel like I know you, but not really. Just in the two minutes before the podcast started, I found out you're like 10 years older than you actually look like. And you're a father and you're soon to have a newborn. Dude, if people knew that you've got a toddler at home and a new baby on the way, they will probably perceive the meetings that they have with you and the time that they get from you and everything differently. There's a human aspect, especially if the other person has actually had kids themselves. They know what that stage through life is. And yeah, I agree with you. Like, How can we maybe increase that human connection between people? Because yeah, like the whole, like, like a mentor program almost. I don't know. Which is, yeah. and then, yeah, speed dating. But Again, I think it's a lot about getting to know each other across the ecosystem and then mentoring is a great way, is a great way to do things. And I think that it's also very important for people to remember that because you like, you have a mentor agreement in your calendar, this is not something you can skip. Do you know what I mean? Like 
also people in this space tend to be so extremely busy. For my own productivity, like I spent the first year being online 24 seven hours. I was following all the Telegram channels. I was following all the Slack channels. I was following all the emails. And then I was also How did you get that baby done? <laughs> and that was before then. That was before then. It was difficult. Oh, so then, the baby actually helped you stay awake. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I was having baby on my thing, checking, checking Twitter on my phone and then being on CoinGecko looking at prices going up or down. So stressful. So stressful. And people don't realize that they, they're on the apps to burn out. You don't realize until you're just so tired of doing your job. You're like, oh, it makes sense to work towards this goal. It makes sense to do these things, but I can't get shit done because I'm so demotivated. And I think that's a very important lesson for everyone to learn as well, that it's about focusing on what makes you happy when you go to work. That's easy to say, right? Oh, I want to be happy when I go to work, but people should try to focus more on it. And then doing high impact stuff because this is also what I don't like about the crypto world. It's like it's so fast paced that we tend to forget about ourselves. And if you haven't met each other in person, you don't even respect people. You don't even realize that it's real people behind that. You just ping them 24 seven whenever, which is also the great thing about things like you can really get stuff moving. But I think we tend to forget that at the end of the day, we're, it's still humans until the AI is on the blockchain. In the meantime, we'll have to do the speed dating. Yeah. See how many more near baby, near cat babies we get out there. Yes, exactly, um, sir. Yeah, I don't think the odds are looking very well. There's two women in the ecosystem. But, but have you heard the saying, this may be a book, so good they can't ignore you? I think, yeah, I definitely heard it before. Yeah. It may just be a saying. Yeah. I really like that. And it's funny because I've started doing some work with DevHub and I think it's been like, I've lost count of the meetings and how many hours we've just been talking and there's like a controller group for Neocon and stuff. And I really like it. I respect being part of something larger than myself and seeing how other people with real jobs do things. But at the same time, I just love that I can just jump on my Twitter and my personal tweet from my account is like the main way that people are finding out about the bounties for DevCon. And then they retweet me. Or sometimes... It doesn't happen often, but it's happened recently. Ilya Quok tweets you and, and adds a bit to the conversation. It's the little things that really highlight to me first. Just do your own thing. As you say, deep work and then come back when you have something to show. Could be a product, could be an idea, could be something meaningful to show. You don't have to be there whining and crying for attention. But the second one is... Other than the obvious not striving to death and, and financial remuneration, what people really want in many instances is just recognition. Feel like what they're contributing is being seen, it's being appreciated. And I gave the example of Ilya, but I'm pretty sure that when the Nearwick account does that to people, it has the same impact. Like it, it has that special feeling of, wow, a large account followed me or they liked what I posted. Or I and, and for me, the reasoning there is... And this is my actual journey. It's not that maybe you loved the content. Like maybe it was an okay thread. Maybe you already knew that information. But if you like it and you nurture that behavior, dude, I would love to see more threads and more content about product and the technology and people being excited about what they see in the ecosystem than fucking threads about the NDC. And they're all negative, by the way. No one's excited about the NDC. But that's politics, right? No one ever has any... Uh, journalists rarely say something nice about a government. It depends the country and it depends the, the government, but... That's true. But but I agree with you, B. Like, but that's also been... That is that is one of our core focus and key areas we want to really grow in for the next year or so is like helping the near ecosystem grow more KOLs. Personal accounts, whether it's content focused, whether it's technical content, because right now the only technical KOL we have is more or less Ilya, Alex Shevchenko now and then. We have a ton of people in the ecosystem who contribute a lot and we want to empower those people to put out content. People care about people, right? People follow people. Bowen Wang is good. Mm -hmm. When he tweets, he's good. He's very Agreed. succinct. Max, Maxime, Devop Max. Yeah, or a Pagoda Max, he's good, and I've been told is he is 
So he's got some views and he's, he doesn't fuck around, which is great because I thought he was the opposite. He's, he portrays himself as being very low key, but I think you're right. We need to, uh, there's a fine line between technical and where technical meets part. Yeah. And I know that I'm probably sound like a hypocrite because obviously I was probably one of the loudest voices around some issues in governance. Perhaps over time it's flared up, but in general. I'm actually really happy that push for more product and being founder centric has actually now expanded every vertical. So the NDC KPIs are share a voice, which is basically marketing founders. I forgot the third one. It's related. Basically activity on chain or something. I'm excited. Me too. Peter, I was meaning to ask you a long time ago, what was your undergrad and what was your master's on? My undergrad was business economics and philosophy. So basically took like a, yeah, like making business school had this really great course, which was a, a full undergrad philosophy degree, like in the history of philosophy and then moving into more modern parts of philosophy that could stimulate, I'm going to say stimulate thinking, but just like the bigger thoughts. And then you had business economics on the side of things. Funny thing was that being a business student, the business school had this magazine and they would do like a, I don't know, monthly publication. And then they would, for some reason, once a year, they would walk around as the students, which education in the school do you think has least of its, how do you say, existence to exist? And everyone would say the philosophy one, right? Which I actually don't get. Oh my God, that's savage. Yeah, it was super savage. And now they basically, they closed it down, but. I learned a lot of yeah. critical thinking. Yeah, they closed it down, but I learned a lot of critical thinking. Rim actually studied a full degree in philosophy, was about to do a PhD in, oh, this guy, I don't remember him. And Ozymandias has a, a philosophy degree. Ladebochka has a philosophy degree. Yeah, just to say, the philosophers on, they're fun. It just, I think it just opens your mind to, I don't know. But... Is there like a philosophy, like dress code, like a secret society? Like how do you identify each other? Because I didn't know that any of you did philosophy, but you seem to know, all know each other. And they didn't teach us anything. I just think we spent way too much time on calls in the very early, yeah, maybe the hats. I don't know. And then we just have, I guess we just have, have had a lot of general Tunics. conversations. Exactly. If you watch Ozymandias, if you're on a call with him, he's going to wear some weird shit. Yeah. He's probably we're a time traveler. Oh, okay. He is a time traveler. That is true. His glasses he's were hundred percent time traveler. 100%. If you could have a conversation mm. with a younger student at your university, or let's assume anyone in the world who sadly may be deprived of a, an education in philosophy, are there any things that particularly resonated with you or that you think could be applicable to anyone that people should know? From philosophy, from my own personal experience was that it's super fucking hard to understand some of these thinkers and you'll get there eventually, or you might not get there eventually, but you'll learn something from study, a subject or a course, which is very difficult. I didn't get to understand every philosopher out there. Sometimes I was just like, I don't even know what this means, but I think it just opened up my mind to being like very honest about that. I don't understand everything someone does and I can learn from them. So. I accepted the fact that I didn't have to understand everything and it opened my mind up to being much more like when I go into a conversation, I don't know about this. You do. Maybe you can teach me a thing or two. And I realized like when you ask people about things they really care about, if they're subject matter experts, they love to tell you more. And for me, that's the greatest way to learn going into interesting conversations, asking the questions you don't know and being honest about it. I think that's my biggest takeaway. Maybe that's why the other students thought that philosophy was the most useless thing to learn because it chooses you don't know shit and you have to Maybe. go learn anyway else. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That is true. But I think it's just trying to stay open-minded and be like. My understanding is that philosophy is like the exploration of thought, which is extremely hard because I find that at least my thoughts, which may be <laughs> fucked up and out of the mean median, but. My thoughts are very dependent on context, historical, personal, emotional, even if you write things and you read what you wrote, a part in time, you're like, oh, 
I wrote that, I have really evolved and grown and there's like layers of understanding. I would imagine it'd be very hard to try to understand and dissect someone else's thoughts, especially because some of these philosophers go back a long period of time and the thoughts that they're trying to dissect is how they're interpreting the world around them. Like, it. And I don't know, man, I think I need some drugs for that. Maybe I did. I did. I think I did too little of that, which also made it, made it increasingly hard to stay in school. So don't do drugs, oh, kids. Well, you live, you drugs love, you learn. And, uh, fun fact. Yeah. Give Last fun time fact. I saw Ilya at the New York Foundation VAP dinner in South Korea, he actually asked me what drugs I was on. What did you answer? <laughs> and I was like, are you serious? I'm not on anything. And he's like, no, but for real, are you normally like this all the time? And I was like, I guess I'm tired. Maybe I've had a couple of beers. I don't know. I thought it was Considering that drugs are illegal in South Korea, you really get in trouble, right? That's the thing, right? Very daring of him. Not, not only to think I'd be high, but smuggling substances through borders. Yeah. Very risky behavior, if you ask me. Okay, so we've got the undergrad. What was the yeah. master's degree on? Um, my master's degree was also at business school in innovation and business development. Again, very broad, but mostly figured around the innovative frameworks and businesses, the study of businesses that succeeded in either innovating a new product category or their ability to stay afloat and keep on innovative. And there are various ways you could stimulate that, but yes, I thought that was really interesting because it was the first time I actually studied something which was more on the, trying to solve a problem. That's innovation. People are constantly, they're looking at, at something, they're trying to solve it, trying to understand it, and there are various ways to doing it. And there are various frameworks to do it. And I think in theory, it's always easy. We studied 10 different business cases. These the outcomes is what you should do in real life. It's never like that, but it gives you an idea of there's not just one way to solve a problem. There are many ways, right? And how do you then choose the most optimal one and how do you facilitate problem solving in a group of people? I'm curious. I know that sometimes some of these courses can be influenced by the industries of the country. I'm guessing maybe Germany has more of the manufacturing side of things. Uh, some other countries, maybe more natural resources. Some may be leaning more towards technology. Was there any particular focus when you were at the business school at the time or? It was like very classical. So it started out with the whole. Ikea? His, yeah, Ikea was actually one of them. But then in general, it's like the history of the history of industry and the industrial revolution was facilitated that. So obviously a lot of advancements in engineering, in production, energy. So looking at what does it actually take to innovate? So you need like a hub and you need a different set of things to make your industry grow. Like you need suppliers, all that stuff. So like there are a lot of physical things that you need in place. And then obviously there are many ways to go about it. If you look at Philips, they build a whole city for the employees so they could be close to the factories. That's one thing, bringing your labor force closer, bringing everyone closer. You see it also now, and I think it's in San Francisco that all these tech giants, they want to build a tech city more or less, and they're just going to bring thousands of the brightest minds in one place. I read this on Twitter, so it's probably wrong, but I also <laughs> heard that the, at least partially the reason why they want to build the city is so that they can build a big wall around it. <laughs> Yeah. And keep all the homeless people out yeah. and all the criminals out. Sounds reasonable. I'm not going to oppose it. Who am I to no, say? What it sounds like, you could have to be part of the plan too. So I think it's a lot about understanding the infrastructure and then understanding how you share ideas, how you nurture ideas, how you reward ideas, how you incentivize sharing ideas. I think that might be my main cry. I wouldn't say that I get loud. But the message that I try to amplify the most is fixed mindset and growth mindset. And I don't know if there's any studies about the actual statistical distribution, but it seems like growth mindset is a minority. But the interesting thing about the fixed mindset is that, as you said accurately before, it's not that people are malicious or dumb or anything. Is that for some reason, the human brain has a tendency to assume that things as we perceive them now will be like that forever. 
there's almost like a resistance to contemplate alternative outcomes. There's almost like a resistance to even consider what could be done differently. I don't know if you had any innovation projects during business school or even afterwards, but the most common thing that I've experienced every time that I come up with a crazy idea is, oh no, that's not going to work because if it did, somebody else would have already done it. And I'm like, why would it work for somebody else when they did it for the first time? And why can't I be the one doing it for the first time now? Or even if there's multiple people trying, how lowly do you think of me that you think that I may not have a different way of executing? Maybe you build relationships, maybe, as you say, I, I've also been consuming like a ton of podcasts and books and stuff. And I just find it fascinating how there's so many defining moments in the journey of the things that we may be later in time identify as a success that the worst thing anyone can do is to think that they're not important enough to be able to contribute positively towards making something happen. Agreed. Uh, but I think also in that sense, it's like very important to have a examples at least of clear paths that people can follow. So they know that they, you know, it's not that I'm saying there's a recipe to success, but there are definitely, I think there are stories that are similar, which had the successful outcome. And I think it's about showcasing that it's possible to achieve the same and it's not impossible. So it's about empowering people, but that's also difficult. Can you think of an example of something that may have worked, let's call it in the physical world, the web two world, maybe even that it's become like a model that we may not be doing in web three, that we may want to start thinking about it? Oh, top of mind. Want a hint? No. <laughs> yeah. At least give me a hint. <laughs> the one that comes to mind would be around like remote work and digital work. I think that we're really struggling as a fully yeah. distributed. I mean, decentralized is challenging, but fully distributed, yeah. it's a disaster. And I think that most startups or some of the now romanticized startup stories, being able to even sometimes like share like the place where you live or like the office becomes like the headquarters where some people sleep. I don't know. There's something about increasing the human interaction. Agreed. That we need to find a way to, to achieve in Web3. Yeah, I very much agree with that. And I, I think there's at least a human interaction point of view, which we should increase. But I think also, how do you operate as a business who's fully distributed? What are the best practices? You're on Telegram. Everyone in Web3 is on Telegram. They're probably up on a ton of other channels. My Telegram is flooded. Yeah, now I can do like subgroups in a Telegram group that makes my life easier. But how do I actually facilitate a good process if I haven't worked in a big tech company or a big or a big like established company before? I don't know which tools are out there. Should I do all, should I run all my processes on GitHub? Can I actually use GitHub as a way of structuring work, even though I'm not doing or building like development stuff? We're using it now for our content processes and we're using it for our marketing and BD processes just figure out how we actually help each other navigate all of the communication, which is information at the end of the day. I think we need more help in setting up these companies and driving these projects because that is what I believe is the really difficult part. And, and, and I think that's a big element of eco as well. It's technology like, hey, you and I, coincidentally, bizarrely the same age-ish, we probably have a lot to teach and mentor the younger people, but also at this speaking for myself, yeah, sometimes I feel like I'm at a loss. I'm like, it'd yeah. be nice to talk to someone that maybe is further ahead and can illuminate or cast a light in some areas of doubt. There is also an element like beyond some of the processes and the tooling, there's also a really interesting element operating as a decentralized community, because there is a quote that I read this morning on the book, Eco is the Enemy. Ryan Holiday recommended. I think it's Ben Horowitz that says that you don't have to uh, fear dreaming big, but you really have to be careful about is when you dream big and then you start to execute, but then you basically have to break up with people and get rid of people that are just not delivering towards that big vision. And when you wake up in the middle of the night and it's no longer a big dream, it's a nightmare. 
And I think that's where we are at. Community is great. Everyone's in the community. But we need to find ways to really set a high bar on what it means to be a contributor. Yeah. And to really enable and empower people to form different groups. Maybe not everyone works together and really not everyone should be working together. Like even in the NDC, we're seeing 15 people in one house is too many people. We should be able to have many groups of small people, everyone working in what interests them the best or what they're best at. And then we meet somewhere in the middle. I think indie hackers also have a saying like, you should be fine, like firing a client. If, even if they pay you, if they're just not, if they're creating more trouble or holding you back, it's just not worth it. Just get rid of them and keep going. But I think also I'm saying ego is the enemy in centralization might not be that good. I'd actually also, I think I'd like to turn it around and also say that for a centralized vision to work out, what is very important is we need trust. So I think it's also very much since we're not having these face-to-face -face meetups and you don't meet the people that you employ, how do we implement a system in Web3 which enforces trust? Is that based on your previous work experience? Is it like maybe that's what you need to know about? Is it like social connections? Whatever. I think we need some sort of an aggregator. And I know that people have been putting, looking into this for ages. No one's been successful doing it. Once we're going to crack that knot, because if you looked at link, LinkedIn is a trust layer, but everyone can write up what they want on LinkedIn. And then they're just going to apply for a thousand connections. And all of a sudden you're trustworthy. Not really. I read that there's a real challenge right now on Upwork because apparently a lot of people in whatever, India or Pakistan, they all created a fake avatar and named themselves whatever, Hamish or something, and they're claiming to be in Norway. So I think that, ironically, we need the only thing that can't be hacked, which is time. I will never say names, but I'm happy to confess that there were people that when I saw them the first time, thought nothing of them. Second, third, fourth time, maybe grifters, low quality operators. One year in, two years in, the motherfuckers are still around. And I've seen them grow. And I've seen their true intention and I see where they can add value. And I'm exactly. really happy that they're here, but it took a long time. And I'm sure that it's been the case with me for other people as well. There's been many events where it's foundation, pagoda, proximity, and I'm the only community member there. And I have received many looks and I'm sure there were many questions asked, but I think that over time people start to see, okay, he's got these interests not bad intentions, and he can help us in this area. It takes time. I know that there's been attempts. Ozzy was working on the wizards, it's the magicians at some point. The NTC had a vision for it. I've always had reservations about it being too structured or too centralized because people can add value in mm -hmm. any way, really. It's, it's up to them to really show what they bring to the table. I wouldn't want somebody that can do something amazing to not be formally recognized because someone's chart that they made uh, two years ago it doesn't fit that. Agreed. Yeah, but I think in general, it's again about having these open discussions and then building the trust, contributing it, asking questions. And I think we're seeing a lot of good initiatives along that path as well. Right now, we have DevHub, something I'm very excited about. And I love DevHub. Yeah, I love DevHub. And they're doing really great. Which is a great initiative, acknowledging that this is what's needed to grow the developer ecosystem. So NDC as well, we're trying. And then we have all the others. We're doing our well, best and we're learning every day. Actually, it was a question on my million timeline disaster. Asked one of the masterminds behind Nearweek, you must get a lot of exposure to a lot of things happening in the ecosystem, not to say everything. What are some of the areas that you're excited about? Projects, Fancy. verticals, narratives, anything? I think DevDap is really exciting from an experience and also just showcasing. DevDap? Yeah. That. I think that's pretty cool. And then I think in general, what we're seeing from Bowen spinning out the protocol group. So really focusing hardcore on that. I'm not sure if that's out yet. So maybe we have to cut that one out, you know? It's been announced on the one of the town halls okay, on a slide. Good. So as everything, it's out there, but it's not out. out. If I know what you mean. 
And then in general, trying to increase developer awareness. I think that's super cool too. Like whether it's Dev Hub or Pagoda doing it. And then I'm super excited to see more use cases like ICC, Kaching, Sweat. I feel like those are just the first one scratching the surface. And when you look at Kaching, it's up there. I feel like that narrative is not dead. Kaching yes, is crazy. Need, it is. We need more native builders for sure. We also need more Web2 projects that integrate the Web3 stack. What does it even mean to be based on blockchain? I think that's the narrative which is also exciting me the most is looking at going away from the idea that everything you build needs to be built on blockchain, but looking at the blockchain as a tech stack that you can integrate to make your product better, to increase product. I don't know. That would be whatever. That excites me a lot, but I think in general, I think I've seen here like, a, you know, it's a general layer blockchain, general layer one blockchain. We can do many things. What do we excel at? Apparently we can scale a lot without having any downtime. That's great. You can build a lot of really cool products, abstracting away the chain, even cooler, but that's still going to take time. I still feel like the onboarding journey for a Web2 user, we're not at the point where you're just using blockchain-based technologies without knowing it. Do you know what I mean? But we could. You think so? I think right now we could. Can you give me an example? I actually posted on the governance forum, vision for boss. And basically all I'm asking is, so can we use like a one pager where we can identify the user journey or the architecture? So if you want to do onboarding your other wallets, it has to be smooth, no seed phrase, use your phone biometrics, and then you can have everything. Bridges, uh, storage, basically be able to really visualize it neatly. But I think that right now, if you combine the fast auth type of authentication with, with meta transactions, and you can basically abstract most of the blockchain away, the question then is, what do you do? And there's a lot of scope that you can have like a hybrid application. So it can be like web two ish with a web three component. If you do a web, like, like a web three native app, is it self-contained? So everything that you need is within. Or is it interacting with other things like pulling data from other contract or generating data for other contract? I think that we're just getting started. I'm excited about the Neurocon hackathon because at least on the criteria for the main tracks, they're looking for teams that are willing to work on the project longer term. So I think it could be big as far as really going for that mass consumer adoption. I've got a few ideas that I'm going to tried to hack on. Do you want to hear them? Fire away. They say that the good hackers know the code, but best hackers know the judge. Okay. So the first one, which is likely not going to happen is a variation of Minsta. So Minsta, you can super smooth onboarding. The main base wallet is amazing, but instead of just taking a photo and like posting it, I want to just add a bunch of information. So there's a photo and there'd be like the data that the photo represents, like specific metadata or fields. And I want to use it as a real-time global crowdsourced inflation tracker. So the two customer segments would be, first one, maybe you live in a developing country, your central bank is lying to you. Maybe they just don't publish inflation data like happened in Venezuela and Argentina. So people can like just pull out their phones and like track price of groceries, even across different cities, et cetera. But the other one is even more interesting because if you look at the way that the inflation data is captured now in the US, it's super archaic. People go around with clipboards, it's like a six month delay. It doesn't take into account a bunch of stuff. So I thought that that use case of having a large group of people aggregate data and timestamp it in the blockchain and like starts opening the creativity. Oh, what can we do now that all this data exists? And surely somebody may be willing to pay for this data. I, I thought it could have a nice smooth on like sweat coin. They do something on the app, but then there's something viable there in the back end. So that's one idea. Who is going to join your team? Thank you for asking. So there is Elliot Bram, Bram something. He's one of the very active boss developers now. And Vadim, validator Vadim. So they both were nice enough to message me when I started tweeting. I was low-key trolling Ilya. Hey, are you looking for a team for that guy? So they were nice enough to message me. I've sent them this idea. It's called Mintflation and they haven't responded yet. But I, yeah, maybe. 
There is another team though, coming from our weave and MEM, a molecular execution machine. By the way, I got to thank you because I learned about them through the new week newsletters and I'd like to Perhaps think that it. many, You're welcome. many community members are also discovering nuggets in the weekly emails. So they're really nice, very, very nice team. And, and uh, yeah, we've got a, another idea that uh, I may keep until we win that hackathon. I was there pretty surprised to see, not sure if I was surprised, I was very happy to see so many people sign up for the hackathon, like more than 550. That's I was registration like, 557. That really warms my heart. I think that's one of the ways we're really going to grow this ecosystem. And I'm very happy to see that much more. Or baby. Uh, exactly. We have much more of a presence okay. as hackathons all over the world as well. And also seeing what the campus team is doing, driving partnerships with blockchain clubs. At universities. I am so pumped about that one. Are you going to uh, approach your alma mater and run a hackathon at a Copenhagen business school? I know there's a blockchain course, but I'm not really sure if we don't really have devs at the business school. I think I'd go to the IT university. We have a small Ethereum meetup group, but back to like where we started about Denmark and Chalk and all this stuff. Blockchain community, MakerDAO, the guy from MakerDAO, they're actually Danish, right? But apart from that, we don't really have a blockchain community in, in Denmark. No one really sees the benefits yet. Yet. That is to come. We're going to start the I would check out the bounties because Calimero, dude, Calimero is so underrated. Their bounties are actually open-ended, but it is to create a business application, Calendly, or a Google form. And I'm like, okay, I think that the more of these use cases that pop up, People may start thinking differently. Because to be honest, I understand. If I lived in Denmark, I would also give zero fucks about NFTs. Oh, by the way, I live in Australia and I give zero fucks about NFTs. I think that we're just going to push the technology in a way that it just meets our needs. But I am super grateful and mindful of your time, especially with a growing family. I just had one last question out of curiosity. I wrote it down like an hour and 45 minutes ago. How did the concussion happen? I fell on my bike drunk. Oh my God. Yeah, okay, yeah. we may have to take the bid out. Have they paid? No, they paid with like a tiny sum. I just told them I wasn't drunk. That's the thing about them. Okay. Like people bike everywhere, which is cool. But they also tend to, we have a really we have a heavy drinking culture. Like people love to drink in this country. Winter? All the time. But when you fell, was it icy? Oh, it was, when was it? No, it was in May. It was slippery. It was wet. Okay. Yeah. Um, Don't I'm, drink I'm it dry. To hear that. I definitely not. If I had a proposal, actually, it's true. The, the, the original one and one that I just made up. So the original one from the episode with Mike Purvis, we want to get a residential experience. So getting people at least for one week and really just hacking. No conference, no distractions, no talks, just really building and, and cracking the, the big problems. But from this conversation, which I've actually found really insightful and, and enjoyable, enjoyful, I don't know the word is. I think we should have a near group ayahuasca retreat. Yeah, that would be insane. Could be crazy. Yeah, yeah. I'm definitely yeah. down. Let's do it. Yeah, Gus is, in Costa Rica. Uh, Gus's cousin, is, she's been living in the jungle for, I don't know, five or six years with a native group of Indians doing cool. a PhD about, it. yeah, Gus, my co-founder, his cousin. Oh, his cousin. So, yeah, she knows everything about it. I was it. like, bro, I saw like Gus in Vietnam three weeks ago. That motherfucker is not in the jungle. <laughs> oh, he's tough. Okay. That's awesome. Maybe she can give us a hand. I think really a cool friend. Last question, and I promise to let you go. Heroes, can I be onboarded? Because I may have a bounty for someone to walk around definitely. with me, helping me make small videos at Nearcon. I would love that. We should have we should have an IRL session at the hackathon at the hack venue. Everyone's gonna be there. Jordan Starpost joined the team. He's doing part time running Euros. Beautiful. My people yeah. will contact your people and yeah, let's try to get that up and running. I would love that. Like, we just need to put more bounces up there. Peter, thanks so much for all the work that you do in the ecosystem. You are keeping the masses informed and entertained. And thanks for coming on. This has been uh, wonderful. I hope that more people get the five minutes with you so that we increase the human connections. Me too. Thank you very much for coming. For letting me come on, baby. B, keep it real so we meet again. Keep posting. Keep posting. Keep posting. That's awesome. 
that's the end of another episode. As always, I just want to thank you for listening because, let's be honest, you are amazing! And I also want to remind everyone that everything contained in this episode is for entertainment and educational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast shall be construed as financial, medical, or any other type of advice, and you should always consult with licensed professionals before making any financial decisions. Make sure that you like and subscribe so that you stay up to date with the latest episode. We've got a steamy hot pipeline of guests that will keep you entertained right through the bear market. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you soon. Bye.